This morning I asked you those three questions. What is meditation? What is the purpose of meditation? And how do you meditate? And in a very expected way, you answered the questions quite directly and very practically, because that's how our brains are conditioned. Um, we responded with things that perhaps we've learned, either by practice or reading or listening to others about uh, what meditation is and how we do it with, with practical techniques. There's a great book by uh, Evelyn Underhill. Not only is it a great book, uh, but it's got one of the best titles, I think, for a book. It's called Practical Mysticism for Normal People. Now, obviously, I can't read it because I'm not very normal. Uh, but, uh, but it's really good. It basically, the book is, 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 is talking to people who, who, who are under the misnomer that uh, you have to be uh, you know, kind of a holy, contemplative introvert to be um, a mystic or uh, a contemplative. And the book is saying, no, actually, this is practical mysticism. It's, it's a pragmatic look at mysticism for pragmatic, practical people, for normal, everyday, run-of-the-mill people. Um, and it is an excellent book, as well as uh, having a good title. Um, so what I'd like to do uh, is answer the questions, but in a, a slightly more roundabout kind of fashion. Um, I'm going to uh, you know, put my mystic hat on this afternoon. Uh, it's a long pointy one with stars on. Um, and unpack this a little bit more. So be, answer the questions less practically and directly. About 15 years ago, maybe a bit more, 16 years ago, I had a, a moment of revelation, an epiphany, a <coughs> spiritual enlightenment, if you want, call it what you will, where I suddenly realised something that made a, a total difference to everything I, I was about. It was a real paradigm shift moment. There's been one or two of those in my life. Uh, but I made this realisation, or perhaps I didn't make the realisation at all. Perhaps it was gifted to me uh, as I sat in uh, a sense of contemplation. I just started the, the, the contemplative journey. I just uh, realised what uh, contemplation was. I'd started to practice it just by reading a couple of things. I, I, I found my way into the contemplative through Celtic Christianity and how they would spend hours in prayer, in silence and, and things. And I very quickly, reading the life stories of different saints, fell in love with Cuthbert, who's still my favourite of uh, the, the Celtic saints. Uh, and he was someone who, who had a deep love for the contemplative and a deep desire to just go away and be a contemplative hermit. But God kept giving him jobs to do, you know, like being the Bishop of Lindisfarne and little things like that. Um, but really started to try and engage this contemplative practice. Um, and I'd spent about 10 years up until that point um, trying to fit in and engage with the traditional church um, Brief bit of background. Uh, I was born into a family that was a went to a pretty fundamental conservative church. Um, very dry, didn't get much out of it, rejected it by my teenage years. Spent most of my teenage years hanging out with pagans, practicing paganism. Uh, and in a pagan practice, I encountered, uh, a meditative practice, I encountered uh, Christ. Um, and uh, had to kind of readjust my entire being. That was one of the paradigm shift moments in my life. Um, went into uh, training with uh, Youth for Christ in youth work, did some theology training, did some youth work training, spent just over 10 years as a youth worker. So this was, um, I was 19, just almost 20, when I had this uh, experience encountering Christ in this pagan vision. Um, so, and for about 10 years, I was trying to fit in with the, the, the churches I was involved with, because with, I was directly in, interacting with the leadership, because I was doing youth work with them and, and stuff through Youth for Christ and various other organisations towards the end. And I really wasn't engaging with, with that. Um, and then I, 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 I discovered uh, Celtic Christianity, which was the second paradigm shift in my life. I just read this book, and it was the first time I'd ever encountered anything from a Christian perspective 
that uh, resonated with me in my own spirit. And that was the journey I was going to take from then on and has been for the last, um, I don't know, probably um, 18 years or something. Um, and then within that, I found this, this contemplative journey. And then I had this realisation because all of the churches I'd been involved with up until that point were the fairly traditional, uh, you know, uh, churches, different streams, but all fairly traditional, all fairly conservative in their theology. And suddenly it, it came to me. It was like a, a, a flash of inspiration. And this is a moment that I've never turned back from. What came to me was uh, what you believe in should not be the foundation of your faith. There's a second half to this, which I'll get to in a minute. What you believe in should not be the foundation of your faith. Your, your theology, your uh, doctrines, your understanding and interpretations of Scripture, they should not be the foundations of your faith. The reason for that, and you should have some, you should have theology, you should have you know, doctrines and practices, you should have an understanding and interpretation of what scriptures mean. But the reason that you shouldn't have those as your foundation of your faith is because they are supposed to change. How you understand things, what your theology is, it, it's supposed to develop, it's supposed to change. The way you understand and interpret scripture is supposed to change. Paul himself, the apostle, says to, to uh, folks that he's writing in, and uh, he probably said it to more than one group, although it's only in the Bible once. He says, I'm, I'm giving you the milk of the gospel because you can't yet take the meat. You're still babies in the faith. So I'm still going to have to give you the food, spiritual food, like your babies. You haven't developed onto the solids yet. So there's an expectation of... Uh, the development in our understanding of our scriptures and our faith and our theology, it's supposed to develop. We're supposed to gain deeper understanding. We're supposed to change our minds. Thomas Merton, uh, who was mentioned earlier on today, uh, once said that if the me of five years ago doesn't think the me of today is a heretic in at least some things, I haven't matured properly. Now, that, five years doesn't seem too long, but you know, he was a monk. He was quite intense in his, his training and his lifestyle. So we'll give ourselves twice as long. So the me of 10 years ago should think that the me of today is a heretic in at least some things that I believe in my theology. Otherwise, I haven't matured properly. Now, we, we understand this from a, a physical, intellectual perspective. So, for example, if... Uh, you take a small child, three, four years old, out to look out at the night sky. When they look up, they see small, white, silvery, twinkly lights in a black sky. We imagine somewhere like this, where there's probably very, very little light pollution, or Riding Mill probably has got quite little light pollution. And that's what they see. And at that age, that's what they understand. These are twinkly lights in the sky because they're three years old we don't expect them to understand much more but as they grow up and through junior school particularly where on the curriculum is the solar system when they go outside at night and they look up in the sky they see silvery white twinkly lights in a dark black sky but they understand them differently because their understanding has grown and developed and deepened. They don't just think they're twinkly lights in the sky. They now understand that some of them are further away and some of them are actually planets, they're not stars. And the solar system is here, we have our solar system and our galaxy, and then there's others as well. And they understand it more. And then perhaps as they grow up even more, maybe go through uh, school or college, uh, university, they might study this a bit more. This, if, it's the, if this is their interest, you know, study cosmology or something at, at university. When they go out as a university student and look up at the night sky, they see white, silvery, twinkly lights in the dark black sky, but their understanding is deeper. And then they can you know, go on and do PhDs and become Professor Brian Cox and you say stuff and it just goes to most people. Because your understanding has gone beyond uh, the kind of the level of the everyday person. 
when Professor Brian Cox and anybody else who is uh, an extraordinary doctor in, in, in cosmology goes outside at night, he sees exactly the same as a four-year-old child sees, but his understanding is so much deeper and wider and broader. And the same should be true with our spiritual development. If anybody our age was absolutely convinced that the stars were just twinkly lights in the sky, we'd probably get them some help. Uh, and, uh, you know, take them to go and see a, a counsellor or something, or, you know, whatever. Because we, we know this is, this, we're supposed to do this. We're supposed to change our opinions and understandings. Not because when we were four we were wrong, but because when we were four, our level of understanding, depth of understanding was very little. We were on the milk of our intellectual understanding, not the, the solids and the meat. It fascinates me how many Christians don't do that with their theology and understanding. I know in my own journey, I now think the total opposite of certain aspects of theology that I did years ago. Uh, and, and, and I'm happy with that. And I'm fine with the fact that I used to think that, and now I think this. Which actually is really useful, because when I now meet someone who still thinks that, I go, it's fine. They can think that. It's all right. It's a, it's a journey. It's a process. Not that I'm better than them because I understand more and better now, but actually it's fine. That everybody's in a different place on their journey, and, and the things that I think now, the things that I will teach now, I will probably think differently, and hopefully I will think differently in the future. So what you believe in, which is all that stuff, cannot be the foundation of your faith. Because otherwise, when that starts to be challenged, either by your own development or by somebody else who teaches you something different and makes perfect sense but challenges what you think, your foundations are shaken. Your foundations of your faith are rocked and shaken and that can really ruin somebody. And unfortunately, we are uh, conditioned in our, our cultural church to think that our theology is the foundation of our faith. How we understand scripture is the foundation of our faith. And if that's the case, when it's challenged, our immediate normal uh, response is uh, a defensive attack. It's like cornering a cat. It's going to defend itself by sticking out its claws and swiping at you. That's the normal response. It's called a tribal response. That's how our kind of inner primal instinct works. Uh, to fight back, to fight our corner, to make sure our opinion is put down. And you see a lot of this on social media if you spend any time on social media. It's the worst place for it uh, because it's quite anonymous. You can kind of say this stuff and run away. But if, you're, if what you believe in is the foundation of your faith, then when, it's get, when it gets challenged, when you start to change, then your faith will begin to be shaken. So what you believe in should not be the foundation of your faith. Who you believe in should be the foundation of your faith. This was the, uh, the spiritual enlightenment, this epiphany moment, these two statements together. What I believe in should not be the foundation of my faith. Who I believe in should be the foundation of my faith. The God that I believe in, who is unchangeable, should be the foundation of my faith. Now, there is a bit of a tricky link with this. And I discovered this uh, at, the, at the time, or a little bit as I, as I kind of tried, began to progress down this path of understanding. Because what I believe God is, is not necessarily who God is. What I believe God is, is not necessarily who God is. So I believe God is this. Here's my, here's my God. Now that might not actually be who God is, because this is the God that I've been presented in my particular stream of church or particular tradition or a particular uh, 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 minister who might have their own understanding, and this is what has been presented to me. So what I think God is, is part of what I believe in. And that's different to who I believe in. So you then have to go through uh, this, this undoing uh, of, of what you think God is. Because you have your, uh, your, your conditioned um, concepts 
of what God is like. And in Anthony de Mello's book, hey, we've mentioned Anthony de Mello earlier, Anthony de Mello's book, Awareness, and in his teaching awareness, because his books are quite often transcripts of his teaching, um, he talks about uh, idol worship. And he says the most dangerous form of idol worship are those who worship the idol of their concept of God. Mental idols. Stone and wood and metal idols, they're easily gotten rid of. But your mental idols, the concepts you have in your mind of what God is, they're the most dangerous kind of idol worshippers, he says. Because it's hard to get rid of that mental idea of what God's like, what God is. And, and there is a, a tradition within uh, the contemplative uh, uh, stream of Christianity, or the Christian mystics, of the, the unknowing of God. Or, uh, to use a, a technical term, uh, the apophatic theology. Apophatic means removal, uh, negating, taking away, deconstructing. This unknowing of God. Uh, and uh, what, what we, we need to do uh, is, is to, to, to have an understanding of what God is like. And then we need to unknow that. And this is a, a teaching that's, that's uh, been around. You can, you can look at passages in the scripture once you get a grasp of what this apophatic theology is unknowing is like and say, ah, oh, that's, that's one of those. Uh, it was most directly brought into uh, the Christian teaching, Christian heritage in the 5th century by a, a Greek writer called Dionysius the Areopagite, who in later years became known as Pseudo-Dionysius. Uh, because um, he, 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 he was presented as the Dionysus that we read of in the book of Acts. Um, and uh, that's, how, that's who people thought he was. So he, people took his writings as if they were being written at the same time as the Apostle Paul. And then it wasn't until the 14th century uh, that various people, including Thomas Aquinas, went, hang on a minute, he's talking about stuff that happened 200 years after. Uh, so he probably can't be that. So he became known as Pseudo-Dionysius rather than Dionysius, the Areopagite. But he wrote a whole uh, big teaching uh, on mystical theology, this unknowing of God. Uh, and for the first few hundred years, it was in Greek. Uh, so only a few scholars uh, were able to use it. And then an Irish theologian in the 8th century, uh, sorry, the 9th century, the 800s, uh, called John Scotus Eriugena, translated it into Latin. So then it became much more widely available to the Western church, this uh, unknowing of God. Uh, and then it kind of reached its peak uh, of teaching in the Middle Ages, where Thomas Aquinas and Meister Eckhart really, that was the main thrust of their teaching in the, uh, the 14th century, 13th, 14th century. If you ever read uh, Summa Theologica by Thomas Aquinas, uh, that's the very core, the root of it, um, this, this unknowing of God. And of course, at the same time in the 14th century, they were both in Germany uh, and in uh, Britain and England. In the 14th century, there was the cloud of unknowing which, again, the whole title of the, of the, the book, as well as the, the, the theme of the book, is this unknowing of God. Uh, this sense of, uh, of deconstructing our cognitive understanding to something deeper. And so my answer to the question, what is meditation, is that it is a path to unknowing. It is a way of uh, getting to the unknowing or, or traveling the path of unknowing, a way of unknowing, because it's not about cognitive understanding. It's not uh, a learning of theology, and I'm all for that. It has its place. You know, I've got a master's degree in Christian spirituality, and I did essays on all these mystics and stuff. So I'm all for learning, and, I'm all, and I think it's got its place. And I think it's important for us to, to cognitively understand what the Bible says in its cultural context so that we can get a proper grasp of what it's trying to say but there is also a place for this this bigger concept this unknowing of god uh, a phrase that uh, kind of threads through lots of the, the christian mystics is um, that you can you, you whatever concept of god you have it's inadequate compared to the effability of god the the eternal uh, grand, grandness of god Ta uh, meister eckhart uh, taught on this very specifically and, and uh, he was um, some of this stuff was kind of poured out by the traditional church as being a bit of a heretic uh, a bit of heresy uh, but he said oh, I'm glad <laughs> um, uh, he was famous for a, a prayer 
that said, God, rid me of God. That was his prayer. God, rid me of God. Uh, Looking at the context, his prayer was the ineffable reality. Rid me of my concepts. Because I cannot really engage with or understand the, the ineffable reality of God if I'm looking at it through the concepts that I have. They're very narrow. Uh, and it, 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 what I found is this unknowing of God, this apophatic theology, uh, helps uh, to, to cause us, it doesn't answer the questions, but it causes us to not have the questions. Uh, and one of the, one of the questions that it causes us not to have is, uh, if, if God is good, how come there's evil and suffering? It doesn't answer the question. But it gives us the perspective of saying, well, actually, and Eckhart, again, Master Eckhart said this, we cannot say God is good, because then we think God is like our concept of what goodness is. And we expect God to behave in our restricted boundaries of what good is. And God is beyond that. In the same way that as a child, we might not think our parents are good all the time because they don't just give us sweets. And I want more sweets. And my parents are being mean, and they're not very good because they're not letting me have more sweets. But in a broader concept, as a parent, we know that if we just give them sweets, it's not going to be good for them. They're going to be ill, they're going to be overweight, it's going to be really bad for them, they'll end up with diabetes. But from a child's perspective, this is not a good thing. My parents are not very nice. And it's when we look at God like that as a child and go, God, if we say God is good, but then this stuff happens. How how can God be good? Because we have a a very limited concept of goodness. So Eckhart said, we cannot say God is good because then we box God in. What we need to say is, uh, I don't understand the the enormity, the ineffability, the, the eternity of God. And so from my perspective, I don't understand how I can, God can be uh, an, uh, not evil, if you're going to use, you can't use the term good, if God's not evil, not malevolent, but there's also suffering. Because God is broader and bigger. So like I said, it doesn't give us the answers to the question. When someone says to us, what's the answer to the question? If, if God is good and loving, how come there's evil and suffering? We can't answer the question with uh, uh, unknowing the apophatic theology, but it does mean that we don't ask the questions because what we realise is that our brain can't cope with the broadness and vastness of God. So meditation for me is a, is a, is a way of unknowing. It's a path into uh, stepping out of my cognitive uh, processes and allowing something bigger to take over, allowing myself to be absorbed into something more. And that is the the enormity of that divine presence, the reality of God. So meditation for me is is not just about the practices of being still and being calm. For me, actually, uh, the being still, being calm, having this uh, connection with God, is they're all byproducts. For me, meditation is just a way of me letting go of the cognitive theological study that I've been doing and engaging in unknowing and and letting go of that aspect to to life. And and that leads me into uh, the the, the second question. So that leads us into uh, the purpose of meditation. What is the purpose of meditation? If meditation is a way of unknowing, the purpose of unknowing, if you want to use those terms, is actually... Uh, I would say to live from a a higher perspective, to live from an understanding of a higher conscious awareness. So my my answer to the question, if you're going to, in this context, if you're going to flow from that, what's the purpose of meditation is to live from a higher consciousness, a higher conscious awareness. Practice the unknowing or the path of unknowing has brought you to this this sense of higher consciousness, higher awareness. And this too uh, is not something that's been brought in from Uh, New Age or Eastern philosophy, the idea of living from a higher consciousness. It's actually a biblical concept. Uh, It's a concept that Jesus talked about a lot, but we don't translate it into those words. We translate it differently because uh, the Latin Bible didn't have a word for the Greek, so they threw something extra in. And then we used the Latin Bible for 1,700 years before it was translated into English for the first time. 
And by the time it was translated into English for the first time, we'd had this uh, concept uh, as part of our understanding and being that this is what this word meant. So it was translated to English uh, via the Latin. And actually, even if you look up the original Greek in some concordances, it will have the Latin understanding rather than the original Greek. The word uh, that we have that I'm going to use uh, in the English is the word repent, which is translated from the Latin Bible, because the Latin Bible put the word penitentiali in that place. Because when Jerome was writing the Vulgate in the uh, late 4th, uh, early 5th century, there wasn't a Latin word that directly uh, related to the Greek word in those passages. And it was at the beginning of the time where Constantine had legalized Christianity, and Christianity was about, uh, you know, kind of forming culture. And so they needed to have some sense of the church guiding and leading the formation of this new Christian culture. And so Jerome used the word penitentiali into Latin, to, to be sorry for what you've done wrong, which is why we have the word repent in English. Uh, to be sorry for what you've done. That's what our word repent means. Repentance means to be sorry. So that's what we think Jesus talks about. That's what we think it means, because in English, Jesus walks around going, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. And the apostle Peter uh, in the book of Acts says to people, repent and be baptized. And we think what we need to do is we need to say sorry. And we've created prayers and all sorts. Uh, and maybe we've each said that, that what's called in the uh, evangelical movement that I was uh, in when I was a young boy, uh, is this sinner's prayer. And that you have it printed on the back of you know, Journey into Life and other booklets that tell you how to become Christians. Um, you say this sinner's prayer, and then, and then the, the, the theology is, uh, once you've said this prayer and meant it, you know, the moment before you said it, you were a sinner and off to hell, and after you've said it, you're saved and off to heaven. Uh, and that's the that's theology behind that. Um, and I'm, having no, I'm, I'm not going to get into the theological discussion, um, my point is that that kind of uh, repentance is not what Jesus was talking about. It's not what the original Greek writers wrote. If you look at the original Greek for the word that's translated as repent, it's the word metanoia. Metanoia is what Jesus said. Well, that's what the Greek writers, he would have been talking in Hebrew and Aramaic. But when they wrote the Gospels in Greek and the Acts, Book of Acts in Greek, they use the word metanoia. Now, like Hebrew, Greek is a very, very rich language, unlike English, which is very poor as a language compared to uh, Greek and Hebrew. So we have one single word uh, that will mean something where the Greeks have and the Hebrews have numerous words for it. Arguably, the most famous word is the word love, where we have one word for love, whereas the Greeks have four words for love. And you can tell what kind of love they're talking about, whether it's uh, eros, which is romantic, sexual attraction, uh, philios, which is friendship, uh, sturgios, which is family, and, or agape, which is unconditional. And in, in the New Testament, different words were used at different times. But we just have the word love. Uh, but the, the Greek language is like that with so many other words. And so when they wanted to say something, they had a lot of choice of what word to pick. So the word that was chosen was a very specifically chosen word on purpose. So metanoia was deliberately chosen by the original gospel writers. And, and if we just take that, that Greek word, metanoia, and just break it in the two halves that it's in, it's a prefix and a suffix, we still use the prefix and the suffix in other words in our modern parlance. The word meta and the word noia. The word meta means higher or beyond. We use that in things like metaphysics which means things beyond the physical. We use it in metaphor, which means uh, beyond what we physically see. It's more than what you see. So meta means higher or beyond. Noia, we still use as a suffix, most commonly in paranoia. Uh, and if you know your Bible, you might know what a paraclete is. Someone who is next to you and draws alongside. That's the Holy Spirit is called the paraclete. Para means next to or adjacent to, like parachute. There's another one. Paranoia means you're adjacent to, next to, your mind. Noia means your mind, your conscious awareness. Paranoia means slightly out of your mind, your conscious awareness. So metanoia literally means higher consciousness. 
or beyond the conscious awareness. That's what Jesus was talking about. That's what the Apostle Peter was talking about. When Jesus was walking around saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near, he was saying metanoia. You know, think outside of the, the conscious awareness. Think from, live from, a higher conscious awareness. Raise your consciousness above the earthly sense of awareness. Live from a higher sense of awareness, or as the Apostle Paul later put, set your minds on things of heaven rather than things of earth, which is another uh, f- a fuller phrase of what metanoia means as a word. Or, uh, again, the Apostle Paul said, uh, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This is the same understanding. So the, the purpose of meditation for me is to lead me into living by this higher consciousness. It's to raise my conscious awareness above the normal conscious awareness or, or deeper. Uh, we can have this kind of uh, oxymoronic uh, understanding that uh, deeper and transcendent are the same thing. Deeper and higher are the same thing. Uh, so Thomas Keating, who we mentioned uh, earlier, uh, uses these, the, the, the water and the boats and things as his illustration. And he uses another one to talk about what centering prayer is about. And he says that uh, the, the river is like a, uh, your, or the, the water is like your conscious awareness. The surface of your water is a normal level of conscious awareness. The stuff that you have to be engaged with in your everyday. That's your normal level of conscious awareness. And boats are... And the thoughts that are on your conscious awareness, they just kind of skip across your the normal level of conscious awareness. But, he says, rivers, water bodies, they have depths as well. And the deeper you go, or the more centred you become, he says, because he's his centering prayer, uh, the further away from this uh, surface level conscious awareness you, come, you, go to, you go from, you go further away from that, more and more into the divine presence, the divine reality. And what he says is there is this journey to the very core, the very center of our being, where the divine presence lives. And this is a thread that comes through uh, the mystics a lot as well. So if you've ever come across or read The Interior Castle by Teresa of Avila, this is the same teaching, that there is in the center of our being the divine presence. And you have to go through the different uh, entrance levels and walls and rooms of the uh, castle, the interior castle, to get from the outside to the inside. Her interior castle is a crystal castle, or a glass castle. So she stands on the outside and can see her aim, her goal, in the middle, the centre. But she has to go through all these walls and doors and things and levels to get there. Uh, Julian of Norwich also said that there is a, a centre point within my being where the whole of my world revolves, and that centre point is God. The very core of our being, Thomas uh, Merton said the same thing, that there is a, a, a cent- in the centre of our being, the ground of our being uh, is untainted by everything because it is purely God. It is the divine image that Genesis talks about. And so we go into this uh, deeper level. So this higher consciousness draws us into a deeper level. So the purpose of meditation for me is to be drawn into a higher consciousness, to live in a, a higher consciousness. So what is meditation? It is a, it is a way of unknowing. What's the purpose of meditation? It's to then live in this higher consciousness. So you deconstruct the concepts of who God is uh, and what this d- ineffable divine reality is. Uh, you lift your mind out of or above the normal level of consciousness and go deeper. You use that that paradox of going deeper and lifting higher is, is a, a, a same thing. So how do we meditate? That's the last question. How do we meditate? My answer is simply awareness. You live a, a life of awareness. You can answer the question as we all did of how you meditate, of, of using practical applications, but actually those are all uh, pathways to living a life of awareness. And awareness comes from living in this higher consciousness, living in the unknowing, living out of this higher consciousness, you begin to live in a total awareness of the divine presence, the divine reality. And it is possible. We, we read stories of other people and, and can experience it ourselves. And sometimes it's just a glimpse of experience. But it shows us that actually it's a possibility. 
that we can live in this state. Now, living in this state of, of higher consciousness and total awareness of the divine reality doesn't mean that you're disconnected to what's going on in the real world. There is a, a phrase that I think is a complete nonsensical phrase if you really unpick it and see what it means. The phrase is, and I used to, this was, this was uh, something that came from my childhood, I, the church that I grew up in used this phrase, uh, that you, 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 don't, you need to make sure that you don't become too heavenly minded to be no earthly good. I think that's complete nonsense. Because I think the most heavenly minded person was Jesus. And he was the most <coughs> earthly good that anyone has ever been. Now you can become a, a little bit highfalutin and holier than thou. But that doesn't mean, that's not the same as being heavenly minded. In fact, the scriptures tell us to be heavenly minded. Like I've already quoted, you know, draw your, your thoughts to the things of heaven and not the things of earth. Think of the things above. Think of this higher things. Uh, because actually, the more you're connected to God, the deeper you are in your relationship with God, the more you're actually connected to the world. The more unity you feel with everything, the Buddhist uh, aim is to become one with everything. Well, if, if God is in everything and we become one with God, then we become one with everything in a kind of conscious or subconscious or higher conscious awareness. That actually, the more absorbed you are in God, the more aware you are of other people and other things and stuff that's happening. Because God is totally absorbed in all of those things. And actually what we, what we can discover, what, we, what I've discovered, is that in these moments, these, these pockets of time where I'm totally absorbed in this and, I, and I'm in that sense of total awareness, someone or something will come to my mind. You may have experienced this yourself. And I will go, oh, do you know what? I just need to send them a message or phone them up and say this. And I'll just send a text. In the middle of this meditation, I'll stop and go, I need to do it now. Or sometimes I'll, I'll go, I need to do that, but actually I need to do it at three o'clock this afternoon. I have no idea why. And I'll do it. And 96, 97% of the time, I get a response saying, it's exactly what I needed, exactly the right time. Often, how did you know as well? You know. So actually, we're not becoming too heavenly minded to be any earthly good. Actually, we're becoming so heavenly minded to be more earthly good than we can ever be from a practical level. This, this constant awareness. You meditate by uh, living in a state of awareness. Now, the practices, the practical disciplines, they're just a pathway that leads you to this place. They're just the way of getting there. It's just uh, the, the path up the hill, as it were. Uh, we, we, you, you, you talked about this, this sense of uh, getting rid of stuff and clearing out the rubbish. This is uh, one stage of uh, the traditional contemplative teaching. The first stage. Traditional contemplative teaching, the, the, the old Christian mystics, all taught of this three-stage process. Uh, purgation, illumination and unification. And purgation is the clearing out. That's where we get the term purging from. So purgation is clearing out the clutter and the rubbish. And it is the purgation stage that is the discipline that we put in to practice meditation. The time that we put in to do it, the, the actual practice, the things that we do, the, the breathing focus, the, the, the prayer beads, the listening to music, the, whatever it is that you do. The actual practical application. This is our discipline, the things that we put in. We are deliberately clearing out the clutter. We are in the process of purgation. But fortunately, God also does it with us. We're not left to do it on our own. God does it with us. There's a great passage in uh, 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 3.18, uh, where Paul is talking about uh, when Moses came down from the mountain, he had to wear a veil uh, over his face because the glory of God shone. Uh, and he says, well, now we don't have to wear a veil. Now the veil is gone and, and using that veil of Moses as an illustration of the temple curtain that was ripped at the crucifixion. The veil is gone. The glory of God is out for all to see. And then he says, and, and we with unveiled faces are like mirrors reflecting God's glory. 2 Corinthians 
And the more we allow the Spirit to work in us, the better reflections we become of God's glory. God cleans us like we would clean a mirror. This is the, the, the two sides of the purgation. We do stuff and God does stuff. And part of our job is also just to let God do stuff within us. So we become better reflections of God's glory. That's the purgation. The illumination is that once the clutter has gone, the divine light can shine on us and in us and through us. Because we've now got nothing blocking the way. If you imagine that purgation uh, includes maybe cleaning the windows of your soul, not your eyes, obviously, which is the phrase, the eyes are the windows of the soul, but actually, you know, imagine your soul has windows, like it's a room like this, and the windows are covered in grime and dirt. So the purgation process, the, 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 uh, the, the process of, of, of decluttering ourselves, which is sometimes can include the, the, the practical applications of, of meditation practice, includes that kind of clearing of the, the window, the washing of the window. And as you wash the dirt and grime off the window, the sunlight shines through. It's not that before you cleared the grime, the sunlight wasn't there. The sunlight has always been there. It's just that it's been blocked from coming into the room through the window. And so this purgation process, a balance of us and God, allows the illumination process. And the light shines in and through and out of us. Uh, so that, that when Jesus said, I am the light of the world, and I am in you, and you are in me, and then he said, well, not then, because it's a different chronology, chronology, but then he also said, you are the light of the world. So I am the light of the world, and I am in you, and you are the light of the world, because my light is in you. I abide in you, and you abide in me. And he is wonderful, mystical phraseology that doesn't make any sense if you try and think it through. Uh, but this sense of... The divine light shining into us because we have created the inner environment to do that through the unknowing uh, and through the, the, the raising our minds to the things above, living from a higher consciousness. So the awareness of that divine presence that now shines through us or reflects off us as the spirit has been involved in that purgation. And we are reflections of the glory of God, as Paul said to the Corinthians. And we just live in this sense of awareness. That's what God's doing. That's what's happening. That is how I meditate. I am aware that God is doing this stuff. Uh, and yes, it includes practices and disciplines. But that's the awareness. And then the unification stage of this three traditional, and I'll finish with this for, before we have a small break. Uh, the unification stage uh, is the sense of becoming one with God. That we begin to, to lose uh, an understanding of where we stop and God begins because actually there is such a merging and such an interweaving of our beings that we, we become one with God and, and the, all the mystics say uh, that you can, you can get to a stage of life where you begin to do that. That will never be fulfilled until you're in heaven. You will never become fully one with God and understanding and, and, and the character of God until you are in heaven. But you can begin that journey, that process. Uh, through the illumination, into the unification. You don't become God, that's different. But you can become one with God. You can become of one mind with God, as the Bible says. Uh, and have the mind of Christ, as the Apostle Paul says. And so there is this process. Unknowing is the beginning, uh, which leads us to a, a higher consciousness, living from a higher consciousness, which enables us to live a life of awareness. That's really what meditation is, the purpose of meditation and how we meditate. Well, that's what I think anyway. So I'll pause there for a moment. Um, let's have five minutes to just uh, stretch our legs and um, have a comfort break or, or whatever. Uh, and then come back and I'll do another guided meditation Bit, and then we'll have an opportunity for you to respond off, off the back of all that. And by respond, I mean you can ask questions, you can uh, uh, tell me what you think of what I said, you can disagree with me, you can call me a heretic if you like. It's entirely up to you as long as you do it nicely. Uh, then we can have conversation afterwards. So let's take a, a few minutes uh, a break and then we'll come back. So take five minutes just to stretch your legs. <laughs> 